strangely she fought like hell. Couldn't go along with anything. She used any kind of tongue cut on her? Same thing. I pulled her out and left like a bat out of hell. This is the voice of the infamous tourniquet killer. Operating from Houston, he claims to have attacked over 60 girls using his signature weapon, a makeshift ligature, better known as a tourniquet. As his list of victims kept piling up, the panic in the community reached new heights. Many people took extra precautions to protect their children, but Anthony Shore, a single father raising his two daughters, completely surrendered to the paranoia. Girls at home, locked in the house, and they're just dismissing it. Anthony had a very good reputation in the community, and many praised him for showing such resolve amidst the chaos. Now to a father who many say did what he had to do to protect his young daughter. But as the years went by, Anthony revealed himself to be much more dangerous than he seemed. What? The longer that we lived with him, the more we were afraid. As each of the attacks Wait, of the tourniquet killer grew closer and closer to their home, Anthony removed the girls from school, nailed shut his doors and windows, and trapped his daughters Tiffany and Amber inside his house. He would barricade us so that we couldn't leave. We were 100% locked in. On top of that, Anthony himself grew unstable, often disappearing in the middle of the night. Back then, I just accepted he had a long day at work, but in hindsight, it's just not realistic. But Tiffany refused to stay silent. Instead, she confronted her father and went on to play a pivotal role in bringing the tourniquet killer to justice. Tiffany broke this entire case because she had the courage to stand up. In the city of Houston, Tiffany and her older sister, Amber, live a cozy life with their parents, Anthony and Gina. The man is a well-known musician, playing in multiple local jazz bands. Between his day job as a landline repairman and his musical career, he still manages to spend a lot of time with his two young daughters. We would go to like the Renaissance Fair or w do art so or just always something oh, fun. Be but behind that perfect facade, the family has their problems. Gina and Anthony fight often, and their marriage is crumbling. Eventually, she meets someone else and files for divorce. She wants both Anthony and her daughters out of her life, so she gives him full custody. But Tiffany what? liked her father and didn't mind moving in with him. He was funny, he was smart, he was talented. The fuck? He was all of those Come things. On. But unbeknownst to Tiffany, something sinister loomed in the neighborhood. In the past few years, two young girls had been murdered close to her home. It may not be as safe as it used to be, so there was some concern among the community about the possible dangers to their children. Thursday, September 26, 1986, 14-year-old Lori Tremblay, a teenage girl from Central Houston, vanishes. She was just walking to school in 1986, and she ended up missing. The following day, the police discover her body. Lori Tremblay was found in the parking lot of a restaurant behind a dumpster and uh, had been strangled to death. The sole piece of evidence they have is her cause of death. Knuckle joint impressions and ligature marks around her neck suggest she was strangled with a rope or cord with nothing else to go for. The case quickly goes cold. The investigation sort of runs its course and they've chased down pretty much all the leads that they think they have. Thursday, April 16th, 1992, around 10 a.m., a delivery man pulls into the parking lot of a West Houston Dairy Queen. When he jumps out of his truck, he stumbles upon a dead body by the drive-thru. Detectives from the Houston Police Department Homicide Division are immediately dispatched to the scene at the Dairy Queen. The police thoroughly examine the body, revealing visible evidence of sexual assault. Additionally, an object is found embedded into the victim's neck, a makeshift tourniquet. This wasn't some sort of like impulse grabbing somebody by the throat and strangling them. Somebody put some thought and effort into this. They spend the no remainder cameras. of the day investigating the crime scene and gathering DNA samples. Fingernail clippings are taken from Maria's body and stored for later use. While they're at it, an unexpected individual arrives at the location. Her father actually goes down to the scene and where police are still, NGO you know, documenting them. evidence and, and he identifies her. Maria Del Carmen Estrada was a young Hispanic woman who worked as a nanny in and around Spring Branch. After the news reported that the killer used a homemade weapon in the attack, a wave of paranoia hit the neighborhood. To strangle the victim with a tourniquet allowed him to ensure that she was tortured, to ensure that what? the death was as slow or as fast as he wanted it to be. 
Her death and a surge in overall crime in the area put the community on edge. We were crime ridden. There were home invasions, people were getting mugged and robbed, people were afraid to leave their house. The Shores are no exception to this. However, Anthony, who's now a single father, goes a bit too far in how he tries to protect his daughters. I was basically just convinced that nothing bad would happen to us if we were locked inside the house. He nailed down the windows in our room and, you know, don't go outside because someone might kidnap you. As the situation worsens outside the house, so does Anthony's relationship with his daughters. He becomes increasingly controlling and manipulative, obsessing over order and perfection. His daughters begin to fear him, always on edge and never knowing when he will lash out next. Our hair had to look a particular way and our appearance had to be spotless and perfect all of the time. We had to talk and act a particular way. Fire Everything here. was just like a show. But if it doesn't go the way he planned it, then all hell breaks loose and everybody suffers in the house for it. A few months after the girls moved in with their father, the neighborhood is, once again, struck by two heavily mediatized crimes. Well, now we turn to breaking news in North Harris County in connection to a violent home invasion there. First, a masked man attacked Selma Jenks, a 14-year-old student, after she was dropped off from school. So she comes home from school and he's inside the house. He's disguised himself. He attacks her. He binds her with duct tape, then rips her while she's screaming and crying. Selma describes her attacker as a white male with blue eyes, but the police are misled by the fact that she survived the attack. This was totally and completely off MO. There was no reason for police to connect this incident with any of the other previous homicides. On Sunday, August 7th, 1994, a nine-year-old named Diana Riebler goes missing. Her parents sent her to buy sugar at the neighborhood's mom and pop grocery store, Whoa. a few minutes away from their home. Their you sent your nine-year-old? You sent your nine-year-old to the store, you fucking... Idiots. 30 minutes later, her worried mother went to look for her. She was frantic, runs back to the house. She tells her husband, call 911, Diana's gone. Within hours of her disappearance, the police conduct a neighborhood search and deploy multiple helicopters in and around Houston. As the sun that sets- was normal, bro? A nine-year-old girl going to the store? Like, it feels like, I don't know about all that, bro. The search for the missing nine-year-old is handed over to the night shift. We were briefed to be on the lookout for a little girl. I mean, a little I was walking to the park at nine, but my mom would never, never let like my nine-year-old sister walk to the park alone. Like girls, it's just, it's just different, bro. It's, it's creeps out there, bro. Well, after midnight, I decided to go check this abandoned warehouse. As I pulled up, I had my spotlight toward the loading docks and some dumpsters from a distance. I see what I think is a small body. Homicide detectives arrive shortly after that, and then they go about inspecting the body. The forensic unit immediately notices something awry about Diana's body. Another makeshift tourniquet is entangled with her neck. Even what? if the police what? try to keep this information to themselves, it isn't long before the news picks up on the story. Everybody in Houston was aware of what happened to this poor little girl, and everybody was just shocked, stunned, and yeah, they were angry. At the time, the police are still unaware that all the cases are linked, but they easily piece together that Diana's and Maria's murders have probably been committed by the same individual. But neither investigation had turned up any evidence that would carry forward in investigating either one of the cases. We worked on them for months and never got the feeling that we were getting anywhere. The fuck, bro? As the situation in the neighborhood deteriorates, Anthony's paranoia reaches new extremes. The girls aren't allowed to go out at all anymore. During the week, they're sometimes permitted to go to school, but are mostly locked up in the house. On weekends, they play a game together that they call Pretend Rock Band. Anthony dresses the girls in costumes and encourages them to dance around the house to loud music. At only 10 years old, the girls do not realize that their father It's so wild that someone random you talk to at a park or holds the door open for you could be a serial killer and you'd no. never know. Dead ass. Dead ass. Has ulterior motives. He was very involved in our dress up moments. He liked to put us in outfits that were very suggestive and my dad definitely was always somewhere watching. 
Another one of Anthony's family traditions is the evening hot chocolate. At first, only Amber, the oldest of the two, is allowed to drink it, but eventually, he offers some to Tiffany too. My sister told us all the time, don't drink the hot chocolate, it tastes funny. And it did taste funny, I remember that, but I just didn't think anything of it. I thought it was some like cheap, nasty off-brand of hot chocolate. The next thing you know, it's morning. We were being drugged. As the year goes on, Anthony what? starts giving Tiffany hot chocolate more frequently, often several times a week. As a result, she gradually becomes accustomed to the effects of the drug. The first time she wakes up in the middle of the night, she is horrified by what is happening to her. I was in and out of consciousness. I remember waking up to that happening, that I was totally naked and that he was doing stuff. And I pretended to be asleep because what? I was afraid. Although she and her sister usually what? share everything and rely on each other, Tiffany is too scared and embarrassed to confide in her about the near daily abuse. What? In a way, Tiffany believes she is safeguarding Amber by not telling her about it. I thought that if I took the brunt of it, she would be okay. She was my rock at the time. That's all we had in life. We had each other. Friday, July 14th, 1995. Barbara Robertson, the Whoa. editor of a local news station, receives an anonymous Hell call no. right before noon. I said, KPRC, how can I help you? His first words were, I have a tip for you. There's a serial killer on the loose. Unbeknownst to Barbara, a 16-year-old named Dana was declared missing by her parents nine days prior. The police categorized her away from the get-go and didn't take her parents' complaint seriously because she wasn't living with them at the time. The caller reveals the location of a dead body. Without knowing whom he's referring to, Barbara keeps asking him questions. In a 37-minute conversation, the caller goes into complete detail on how the body was laid. I said, you are the killer, and he hung up. She immediately calls the North Harris Sheriff and drives to the department to provide him with a statement. I walked him through what was relayed to me in the phone call. I said, he was looking for that spotlight. He gave me details that I know excited him to share with me. The police follow the caller's direction toward a dead-end road past the I-45 north of Houston. There, they immediately locate the emplacement he described to Barbara, but after 10 days outside, the body is completely unrecognizable. Two pieces of evidence are discovered by the forensics team. The first item found is a homemade tourniquet embedded in the victim's neck. The second Jesus piece of evidence Christ. is a set of rings found on the victim's finger. Based on the autopsy report, it is determined that the body had been dumped over a week ago, and the victim is estimated to be around 16 years old. After cross-referencing the timeline and age with missing person reports, the only individual who matches both criteria is Dana Sanchez. With this case added to the pile, the MO of the killer finally becomes clear to the detectives. As a last resort, they assemble a task force Shits. combining the Houston Police Department and the Harris County Sheriff's Department to reopen all of the cases. In the case of Maria De Estrada, she was strangled to death with a tourniquet. Diana Rebillard's case, you had a tourniquet? Dana Sanchez was also strangled. They get everybody on board to try and figure out what's going on because they realize they probably got a serial killer on the loose. Two years after the last victim was found, the situation changes dramatically in the Shores house. Anthony's girlfriend moves in and he wants the girls out of the house for the summer. So he asks his sister, Gina Shore, to take them to their mother's place in California. Gina seizes the opportunity because she knows something is wrong within their household. He was a bit more touchy-feely with his girls than what I thought he should be doing. Twice already, Look. she has reported him to CPS. First in 1993, when she visited his new home for the first time. Child Protective Services was just very quick to dismiss it. They made me feel as if I was overreacting. Two years later, in 1995, she came over for Christmas. When she arrived, she was distressed to see that the situation somehow worsened since her last visit. My brother left his girls at home, locked in the house. All the windows were nailed shut, no babysitter. They had no power, no running water. What? On top of Gina's second complaint, the CPS already had been contacted by Tiffany's teachers the year prior. And then again, Anthony fooled them like he seemed to be fooling everybody. He's very charismatic, he was very charming, and very persuasive. 
and CPS turning a blind eye. Back in California, Gina tries to encourage them to open up about Anthony and their situation in Houston, but they remain evasive and guarded. One day, towards the end of the summer, she casually asks Tiffany a question that shakes her to her core. I'd had a really crappy day at work. And I said, yeah, haven't you ever had something happen you just felt was unjustified where it just made you just want to punch somebody in the throat? Tiffany turned sheet white started bawling her eyes out and started telling me all the things that my brother had been doing to her. He had been molesting her. Kill him! Gina gathers Tiffany, her sister Amber, and their grandmother Deanna to brief them on the situation. This is when Amber finally reveals her side of the story. Amber went ballistic. He promised he would never do that as long as she was compliant and let him do whatever he wanted to her. How dare him ever touch her baby sister? Gina and Deanna then proceed to contact the authorities and press charges against Anthony. But once again, the system fails them. He lived across the street from an elementary school. Sex offenders aren't supposed to be able to do that. All he had to do was just register that he had molested his daughters. Now on the sex offender list, Anthony gets away without any jail time. All he needs to do is provide the state with a sample of his DNA. So when my sister, my grandmother, and I found out that he was let back out, we felt like there Wait, was no- What? Wait, nigga, what? Anna then proceed to contact the authorities and press charges against Anthony. But once again, the system fails them. He lived across the street from an elementary school. Sex offenders aren't supposed to be able to do that. All he had to do was just register that he had molested his daughters. Now on the sex offender list, Anthony gets away without any jail time. All he needs to do is provide the state with a sample of his DNA. So when my sister, my grandmother, and I found out that he was let back out, we felt like there was no sense of justice in the system. We were all what? really angry and also concerned, again, that he was going to come out and retaliate. Five years later, a new cutting-edge DNA lab opens in Dallas, and the Harris Sheriff's Department decides to reopen the tourniquet killer cases once again, with a focus on Maria del Carmen Estrada, the only victim who was found with unknown DNA on her nails. During an assault, especially with a female, it's common to struggle and scratch resulting in skin or blood being underneath the fingernails. But after reopening her case twice already, they are running low on samples. This may very well be their last chance. I had DNA, but you use it up each time you test it. Do we want to use, you know, the rest of our finite sample uh, on uh, sending it to Dallas? It was decided that the ah. fingernail samples would be submitted to see if there was uh, DNA enough to match a suspect. Thursday, October 16, 2003, a breakthrough, 11 years in the making, finally comes through. Amazingly, there's a match, and it's a man in Houston. They had a perfect DNA profile from her fingernails, which matches the DNA profile from the swabs of Anthony show. Anthony is immediately arrested and questioned by investigators. He confesses to everything. Dana Sanchez. Uh, Diana Rivalar case. Rivalar, how do you say it? Rivalar? Rivalar. She told me her name was Carmen. Talk about another case that y'all don't know about. Lori and Tremblay. He even fills the gap concerning Lori Tremblay, his first victim, whom the police never associated with the tourniquet killer because of its divergence from his usual M.O. He calmly confessed to the killings of Maria, Lori, Dana, and Diana, and he also confessed to the raping of the 14-year-old. As this is happening, the Texas news circuit is covering the arrest. This is when Tiffany, now 18 years old, receives a phone call from Amber, who had recently moved back to Houston. I answered the phone and I was like, hey, and she was like, hey, um, dad's a serial killer. Like, I don't even think she sugarcoated it in, in any way, shape or form. With the trial on its way, Tiffany flies back to Houston to testify Jesus against Christ. her father. The policemen are astounded to finally meet the girl who was instrumental in solving the case. Tiffany broke Did this, they kill this entire nigga? case wide open because she had the courage to stand up and tell law enforcement the prosecution aims for the death penalty, wow. so they gather yes. the only survivors they have. Tiffany, Torture Amber, the nigga first, and actually. Selma. Anthony Torture Allen the Shore, for the first time, walked into the Torture courtroom the that's likely to be the scene of his capital murder trial. Torture the I nigga. think that they were bringing I mean, us I mean, in so that they could witness that he had a history of other types of violent crime and no remorse for those crimes, that he wasn't going to get any better, and that the best solution was the death penalty. 
On January 18th, 2018, Anthony Shore is executed by lethal injection. I was just relieved and kind of surprised that it was finally over with. I think it was 13 years from the time he received the death penalty to he was finally executed. So I was, I was glad that it was finally over. 13 years? What Tiffany had to go through didn't suddenly dissipate Jeez. after the execution. On the contrary, it was just another step on her continuous journey to recovery. Yeah. But through therapy and support from her family, she's proud to finally be able to not see herself as a victim, but more so as a survivor. I do feel a lot more confident about my life and about myself as an individual. It's a daily work in progress. <laughs> After the ordeal, Tiffany moves to Arizona to raise her own daughter as a single mother and provides her with all the love and support she needs to thrive and succeed. I want to lead by example for my daughter. I want her to emulate the right things for me. Tiffany has worked as a sheriff's deputy and later joined the Air National Guard. On top of wow. also studying forensic science, she wants to make a difference and hopes to fix the system from the inside. I know that one person can't change the world, but I think that if more people are aware of what goes on and more people that care are slowly worked into the system, maybe it can get better. And the only way to do that is to try. Yes. Bro, some people are, bro, that is scary though, chat. You never fucking know. Before his death, Anthony Shore claimed to have attacked at least 60 girls between 1980s. The remaining 53 are still unknown. Remember these faces. This is who today is about. Anthony Allen Shore's reign of terror is officially over. Sick, sick, sick human, bro. Sick human. It's not a human. It's not even a human, bro. Said I'm on three pills right now, if I'm being honest. Hope my feelings shoot out like a rocket. Niggas thought they had the swag, but I'm really on it. Look at you, just window shopping that new bag I bought.